If you have any throughout the webinar, please ask them in the Q&A box. Um, not the chat box. The Q&A box is the one where it lets you type in a question. Um, that way everybody can see the question and the panelists. Uh, Don, Jason, and James would be able to type answers as well uh, if they're not speaking. So another uh, housekeeping note, I will pay, copy and paste the link to these slides. Um, right here is a goo, gl slash m capital x, lowercase i, one capital c. Uh, you can check out some of our past webinars. All of the recordings and slides are available if you want to check out um, the action to Chrome, some uh, webs and extensions, also managing using the Chromebooks uh, control panel. All of those are available as well. A uh, topic we're going to focus on moving your classroom to the cloud. So this is really what we see is the, the final piece of um, using Chromebooks and getting Chromebooks. We've done a webinar series focusing on um, why you would want to get Chromebooks, looking at how you would manage them, how to use Chrome, the browser, and, and, and utilize some of the web apps and extensions, and, and then also hearing from other schools as to you know why they decided to move to Chromebooks. But the last piece I think is going to be even larger than just this one webinar, and I imagine we'll continue to have these regularly, of how teachers are actually using the web and, you know, Chromebooks connecting to the web in their classroom and how they're, how they're um, engaging with students and um, incorporating the web into their different lesson plans. So to get started, I just wanted to review some of the um, uh, different steps that we see in terms of, you know, creation and moving to the cloud and and focus on some examples that we've seen from Google Apps, as well as some, oops, looks like I misspelled extensions in there, uh, as well as some web apps and extensions. And then we'll go into um, three examples of uh, schools that we have joining us today. We have James Sanders from Kit Bear, at Donna Tuber from um, Richland 2 in South Carolina, and Jason Markey from Leiden High School District in uh, Illinois. And they're going to share how teachers are using Chromebooks um, and engaging with their students. So the first questions we, we get asked a lot when we're looking at Chromebooks is how do I do you know X in on, uh, you know on a Chromebook? So I want to talk about some of those different creation pieces or some of those multimedia pieces that uh, we hear quite frequently. So the first one is is video. So oftentimes in the classroom, video is a very powerful uh, media form where students often create different kinds of videos and. Uh, there are lots of client softwares that come installed on different computers that people like to use. And often when they switch to Chromebooks, it's like, well, how can we do similar types of video uh, video uh, pieces with, with our students? And so I just want to point out some of the ones that I like a lot. So I bolded my favorites, but I listed some other ones as well. So we video, let me just open that up here, is a great uh, new, it's, it's in beta. It's a collaborative online video uh, web Basically. And what I like most about this is it's actually collaborative. So in the same way that you can collaborate on Google Docs and the rest of the Google App Suite, you'll also be able to do that in WeVideo. So you can sign up for a free account. Um, it's again in beta, but it's really a, a really interesting HTML5 um, powerful web app that, that I've, I've enjoyed playing around with. We have other examples as well. Stupiflix is, uh, is here, and we've had several people who've, um, several schools that have use this and are very pleased with it. And you can get an idea of importing your photos and videos and creating kind of, you know, slideshows and things like that. And then another example, um, there's Creative Education. And I think they also created another another um, another type of video. But this one is comes from our, uh, our friends across the pond in the UK. And they have um, some different uh, tools as well. So they also have my well, they have cartoonists, and then they also have this MIDI vid, movie editor. So I think cartoonist is another great example of a web tool that you can use on the creation side of things, and some some tools that you can explore. And then social media is another example of a um, a, a web based uh, editor that you can be able to do. So you can get started by mixing photos. You can add videos and text. So you can. And there's a lot of possibilities in creation. And again, these are all web based tools that you're able to do on a Chromebook or really any internet connected device. To music. So um, this is more on the streaming side of music, but something that we've heard a lot is, you know, well, uh, what, how can we listen to music? And what's interesting is a lot of students today already listen to Pandora or already use YouTube or Vivo to listen to music. And um, anecdotally, I've heard some, some teachers say that when the students have music going, they're able to focus better or 
you know, being able to, to figure that kind of how music will play into the classroom. But also in terms of management of music. So on a personal side, how do you want to manage your music? There's tools like Google Music. There's also streaming products like Spotify and RDO and OG that can allow you to really um, uh, uh, take advantage of all of the different music apps that are that are there on the web. And so that comes up quite frequently when we speak to schools is image editing so or, or screenshots. So I wanted to point out again one of my favorites here, which is Pixlr. Oh, you know, sometimes it gets a little funny if I do that. So I'm just going to go to Pixlr.com. Also a web app in the Chrome Web Store if you do a search for, for Pixlr. But the, the photo editor is really quite powerful. It's one of the, the better ones that I've seen um, out there, and actually the best that I've seen in terms of an online video editor. It's really well done in, in HTML5. If you go into the editor, you really get a kind of light Photoshop type of um, type of editor. So, like for example, you can open images from URL from your computer. You can create new images. So if I just you know, go ahead and create, you get the canvas, but you get all those kinds of filters and drawing and shapes. Um, and the the most Interesting thing are the filters. That's really something that I think people like to use Photoshop for. And you can also do some more, you know, adjustments and see the different layers. And, uh, so it's really quite a powerful image editor, and you can also save these, etc. And so that's one that I like to point out a lot to people who are who are used to some of the more creative aspects that you can do. You can you can use that uh, this this pixel as well. Um, other examples. Let me pull up. Oops. Let me pull up my, uh, my slides here. So Picnic is an editor that Google has. It's in the Chrome Web Store, and that allows you to do lots of fun kind of photo manipulations, and they've got some fun education things. Aviary, there's a whole aviary suite of tools. There's an um, uh, auto editor. There's uh, all, all these different aviary feathers. So it's really quite an interesting um Tool, just do a search for aviary in the Chrome Web Store. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. So if I pull up the Chrome Web Store, quick search for aviary. You can aviary image editor, you have aviary screen capture, audio editor, music creator, feather, markup editor, effects editor. So there's a lot of different tools that are available from aviary, and this is just one of them. Um, and then uh, Picasa, of course, in terms of managing all your photos. The nice thing about Chromebooks is that if you have an SD card or any kind of photos, you can um, uh, quickly upload it to your Picasa account. And uh, with, with the extended services now available to Google Apps domains, schools can turn on Picasa for their students and allow them to host as well. And then Awesome Screenshot is one of the most popular screenshot um, uh, squares or, or apps and extensions out there. So I like to link to that in terms of if you want to be able to take screenshots, you can offer some screenshots. And finally, talking about uh, schools who have some needs that still require client software, there's the ability to do Chrome modding and um, the Citrix and Aracom both have web apps available where you're able to do uh, dial into a remote desktop. So Citrix is a little bit more expensive, but Aracom also is is quite reasonably priced, uses an HTML5 renderer, and you actually then um, set it up so that if you have a, a lab, you know, or, or you have some kind of server already that's got the software on it, like Photoshop or like some, um, you know, maybe Autodesk or CAD uh, software, you might be able to use one of these uh, solutions, these remote desktop solutions, to be able to uh, use your Chromebook and log into those machines remotely and run those applications. And I've heard from uh, a school who's testing out the Citrix, Citrix receiver that having a server with, with, with Photoshop installed on it and then dialing into it via Citrix from the, from the Chromebook was faster than some of their client machines where they had a desktop with Photoshop installed. And so there are some advantages to installing software on a server. You get the speed and the, the processing power and then just using the, the Chromebook to kind of remote into it. These are some of the examples of living on the web and some of the most common uh, questions that people ask when they're moving into working on a Chromebook. So I also want to focus a little bit on Google Apps because on the creative side, and, and we really like to push Chromebooks as a, as a creative tool, a window for students to create things on the web and 
um, the Google Apps really makes that easy and possible. And I know that our teachers joining us today are going to be able to elaborate even more on these examples. But I wanted to touch on a few that I've heard. So, for example, using Google Docs, you have um, people doing collaborative writing, students writing on group projects together, um, creating study guides and class notes. So I've heard from some schools using Docs and they set up a structure and they have um, you know, two or three or four uh, students taking, tag taking notes throughout the, the, the day and they have designated note takers and the ability for students to follow along in the notes or to you know, be able to have it so that other people are capturing different parts of the notes has been a powerful uh, use in, in the classroom. And using um, docs for peer editing and that kind of live uh, feedback from teachers as well, the commenting and discussion uh, capabilities that are in there. Another example is reading response journals in Google Docs. So kind of this, this classroom arc of how you might use Google Apps in the classroom. And then looking at presentations, so we just launched a new presentation re editor recently, and if you have taken a look at it, I would highly recommend it. It is much improved over uh, over the previous editor. But some of that I've heard um, people using presentations is using it for storyboards, um, planning, you know, how they might do a uh, how they might plan their story, um, but also storytelling. So using the slides as kind of a picture book where they're able to illustrate their own um, story using it for brainstorming, so setting up different slides to have different different, um, different topics and have people collaborate, and now you can actually see when and who's on what slide and things like that. And another innovative um, example I heard of was vocabulary lists, so giving, you know, putting a vocabulary word on each slide, and then students would come in and add more information, so add it in a sentence, find a picture of it, give you know the definition, and then um, the students are all collaboratively working on a class vocabulary list. Then you know groups of students are working on different slides. So I thought that was a really good idea. And then um, presentations also has a back channel capability. So if I um, actually in my current presentation do I have it. Oh, you know actually I don't have it on this current presentation. But some some have found that they like the students like to be able to use the kind of chat with the presenter capabilities and presentations and are using that as a way to teach the back channel and how to how to use that. In Google Sites, the use some of the use cases are e-portfolios. Um, there are people are making newspapers and newsletters using kind of the formatting capabilities that you can do in sites. And then a neat one that I heard from a school district in Oregon is that they're using sites as uh, as kind of way to do role playing. So they had the students, you know, set up um, uh, a newspaper and they have a calendar and docs embedded in there, but it's all from the point of view of one of the characters in either a novel that they were reading or a historical character that they're studying about, like, you know, Richard Nixon and, and um, the Pentagon Papers was, was the examples that they gave in here. Another teacher is using sites to plan field trips, doing actual virtual field trips, and then having the students kind of uh, create their own sites alongside that. So doing a virtual field trip, importing pictures from you know different museums or different areas and writing up about it, and then the students can all go on these virtual field trips to their other classmates that have set these up and kind of putting those together. And then finally, drawing. Some examples are using drawings to visualize fractions, so you know using some of the different shapes and cutouts. Um, using drawings for mock-ups, so uh, one example that we have in our template gallery, I think, um, is like this, uh, uh, it's a Facebook profile in, in drawing form, so students were re able to kind of mock up what a Facebook profile might, might look like for a character in history or a character in a novel, and things like that. And other examples, graphic organizers, you can do mind mapping, character wheels, um, in, in the drawing capability. I also linked to some additional resources in here and again I'll post the link to this presentation just as soon as we get started with um, with our teachers as well. And then um, finally I just wanted to highlight some of the education web apps that are available in the Chrome web store. So um, this is a few of them that are educationally focused. So there's Things like Study Stack, which allows you to create um, flashcards. There's, you know, this graphing calculator that's really quite phenomenal. An equation editor. You've got a 3D body explorer. Some there are several uh, math kind of practice type of web apps out there. There's also Digo Highlighter allows you to kind of go around the web and 
and annotate it and save all those things and the more graphing calculators, planetarium. And then also um, some like the Google Art Project, Khan Academy, there's Quizlet, which is kind of a, a neat thing. There's um, Lucidchart, which helps you create different uh, mind mapping if you want to. Quite kind of turns everything off and just lets you focus on writing. And Reader Fast allows you to save different web pages for reading offline. So if you're on a Chromebook and you might go offline at some point, you could save all of your research so that you'd be able to read it later. And some extensions that uh, we found that, that schools enjoy. So after the deadline, does things like um, checking for spell, doing spell check, and, and some other things. Uh, Google related. You might have seen that pop up on some of my, um, some of the things that I had open. Let's see. So if you this page, you'll see Google related is a little toolbar where it pulls up related videos or related links on the web, or if there's maps. So it's kind of a, a way to help students explore other content while they're while they're browsing. Um, screenshot I talked about uh, Google image search actually, or Google search by image lets you search. If you have an image, you can right-click it and then do a reverse image search and find out some more information about it. Screen capture, Google Dictionary is a great one for students who are, um, you know, for example, if I go here and I, well, this is not a great example because there's not a lot of text here, but if I double-click on, on cloud, dictionary, it's not working, but I also go here and you'll see cloud comes up in my little Google Dictionary. You get synonyms, you get the definition, so it's, it's a really great, uh, another great educational um, extension you can use. Chrome is a fun one that you can install that will just appear at the top and give you some ways to take advantage of Chrome. And then there's also this uh, Chrome Vox, which is a screen reader for the web. It allows you, it's an extension that, allows, uh, that uh, reads everything that's going out there, which is great from an accessibility standpoint. So I know I took a little bit longer than I meant to, but I want to pass it on to James, Donna, and Jason, and they're going to share how they're really doing some cool things with, the, with um, their their uh, classrooms. And so, James, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. Can you can you speak? speak? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, perfect. And Fantastic. did you want me to go ahead and give you uh, presentation privileges, or did you have a slide deck you wanted me to pull up, or are you just going um, to? I sent you a link to the to the slide deck if you wanted to share that. Okay, go ahead and introduce yourself, and I'll I'll pull okay. I'll pull it up. All right. Um, my name is James Sanders, and um, my my school down in Cape Los Angeles was part of the uh, the Chromebook program. So a year ago, we had got a set of 200 Chromebooks in our school, I'm using them um, in my classroom in a one-to-one -one setting for about a year now. Um, for me, I think the biggest of being a teacher and using Chromebooks in my classroom is just the increase in instructional time. So for a Chromebook, it on and automatically off, and all the machines are exactly the same. And because each student has a own Google Apps account, it doesn't matter which Chromebook they have. So when they come into my classroom, um, the first thing that they do is pick up a Chromebook. They go down, and they sit down, they open it up, and they just get started. It takes about one minute from walking in to, to being to work um, on the lesson that day, and that's for me because as a teacher and thinking about what do I want to use in my classroom and what are the best tools, um, percent of the time the answer is web-based tools. So if I'm teaching some type of writing project or teaching some type of collaboration project, I want students to be easily able to go in and, do and then elaborate together. So if you could skip ahead and do a couple of slides. In my class A, it's like I said, minutes from the getting started, 72 minutes of instructional time, and really the biggest frustrating thing is convincing my students to all that they can actually shut down their computers, they can go to their next class. Okay. So our entire class um, from the web, and one thing about the web I really like is it's available anywhere. Students don't need to have some special flash drive or special computer to be able to do their work. So this is my classroom website. And it's just a Google site, and there's a bunch of pictures to make like apps for the things or resources I want my students to have. And when we go forward, each one itself is a a blog post. And so if you go to um, historywithsanders.com slash or dot blogspot.com, um, see all of the different lessons. And because it's online, you can see everything that I've taught and all the different uh, sharing that my students 
are doing. One of those great stories is because they're using Google Docs and because I'm using tools like Form as Forms are, is my students will go and they'll be on their iPod Touch or they'll be on their parents' computer, and it doesn't matter if they're using Internet Explorer. Because I did all the work online in the classroom. They can just access it from anywhere, um, and that's that's huge for me. Next, next, next slide. So, this tool Google Moderator and Collaborize Classroom to have classroom discussions where the students can go in. It's great. They each submit their own um, response, and then they can go in and vote up or down, kind of like Reddit style. What the opinions or the viewpoints of the teammates that they thought were great and the ones that were not, not so good. So every day the students are kind of competing to submit the best reflection response or the best response that they can possibly do because they know their teammates are going to be re reading it and, and reviewing it. They need to take over control of this so that it's a little bit to go through it. I know it only if I um, give you the whole presentation control and then you can oh, I gotcha. on your own. Oh, this is just fine then. Okay. Go to the next slide. So Google Forms is fantastic for me collecting homework or any type of written work because I have it in a central place. It's all timestamps, so I know exactly when my students are doing their homework. So about 50% of my students have access to the Internet at home. And so I, I don't do a flipped classroom. It's more of a blend learning because I don't want to assign a video that only 50% of my students can watch or whatever. So I use Google Forms all the time in class, anytime to collect work. And because they send it to me online, I have it, timestamps, and then I can do whatever I want with that text. So if you look at the next slide, sometimes I'll grab all the text, throw it into a Wordle, and kind of get a snapshot of what they learned that day. So that question was, where did the Renaissance start, or what importance did it, what the importance of the Renaissance? And I'm able to quickly see, you know, basically they get that it's Florence. But also, if I look at some of the smart words, I can look at students or find students that um, are misinformed. Have ideas that are a little off and I want to kind of address those. But it was a great day where they need money and trade and Cosimo um, and the Medici family are all important characters and elements of the Renaissance in Florence. And so I knew that that homework assignment went really well before I even jumped in or dove in and looked at individual responses. Next slide. I have three different places to find my tools to use in the classroom. I feel like the web is Ever changing, and there's tools that I can use every day. And so, so if I get on the web, I am never limited by what's on the computer. I don't have to, you know, what I call it, image the computers I'm on. I don't have an ID guy at the school, so I have to do it myself. The web makes that really easy for me. So I use Chrome, I use the different in the Google App Suite, and I find some great examples of stuff in the web store, like note taking apps or typing games or different things like that that my students can do for extension activities. Next slide. This is really great. We're using Google Draw, and I wanted them to create a map of Tenote Lawn. If I'm doing this in a face situation, it would take the entire class period of distributing materials, giving them the paper resources to create a map accurately. And then having them do some type of gallery walk or reflection or feedback would take the next day. Where Google Doc, as it was on the web, the students could quickly post it to the online portfolios, and the students or teammates go around and just give feedback to them instantly. So we're able to go from the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy quickly to the top of it on one class period without wasting a bunch of time on who has the red marker so I can draw blood on the sake or the temple of sacrifice. You know, and wasting my time. It's just okay. Let's get the cool stuff in there. And then let's do the more important analyze and talk about it. Next slide. Tools like Poplet, that's another great one for doing kind of mind maps. You can embed them on different sites, Tumblr, Blogger, and the students can do the same quick, quickly collecting on these and posting and then giving feedback. Next slide. Um, sometimes I will use YouTube. I know YouTube for schools just came out, so I'll create a playlist of videos that I want my students to go through. Some of the videos will be created by me. Some of them I'll be pulling from either the History Channel or some great educational partner, and we'll have stations in the classroom. So I'm actually moving those, so I don't waste time having the students. Hey guys, let's all stand up, move around, and go to the next station. 
there's blocks of class time separated so that they know they're on the YouTube station, so they're going to be watching their videos, completing the, either the moderator reflection or the form, and I'm with a smaller group of students one-on-one. -on -one. The thing is that, that because they're on their own doing their own work, I can get that one-to-one -one attention that some of these students really need, and the they're doing on their own on the computer, and that's great. Next slide. So that's my favorite stories, and it really just shows the power of the web um, and the Chromebook. So we're doing this medieval Japanese geography project, and I'm trying to find some tool for them to be able to do painting that reflected or in the same style as the Japanese geography art. And Google wasn't cutting it for me that day, so I had to find some tool. So I went through the store, the web store, I couldn't find anything, and all of a sudden I discovered this great called um, DeviantArt, and I believe it's in the web store. And, oh, this is perfect. So that morning, the first had already started. When I found it, I'm like, all right, guys, let's go ahead and quickly install DeviantArt. They were in there. They were creating. They did these great pieces. There's the examples. They posted them to their portfolio. And once again, we're able to get to the more important analyzing piece of how does this represent Japanese geography art. And they would say, oh, there's motion or there's nature and stuff like that, rather than spending the day distributing materials um, or trying to do it in some other computer where I have to actually install some program or some painting program. Next slide. Um, with tools like uh, Google Presentation, we're able to keep track of stuff over time. So every time we do a new unit, we'll talk about the social structure of that civilization. And then we just keep building on it. So this is the Aztecs. And then the next slide on um, that presentation would be on the Mayans and then the Incas. And they could quickly back and review medieval Europe or the Aztecs and do that really important compare and contrast that we like to do in history classes. Um, we do video creation, so the students will be explaining some type of um, content they learned. A great example, if you do a Google search for Chris's history portfolio, you'll see uh, a video that uh, Chris created summarizing um, feudalism. Oh, you don't have to do it now, Dana, but it, the teachers can do it on their own. Um, and he's just doing a great summarize, a summary of what feudalism is, and the students are actually reviewing with each other rather than me standing in the front of my classroom just talking at them. Next slide. Um, I want to just quickly show this student's polio. Um, so if we click the link and just show you the that can happen in a environment with Chromebooks. So in one week, um, we scroll down, my able to quiz, quizzing each other, reviewing. They were to post their personal Magna Cartas and making connections. Number six, the day before, they were doing a flow chart, describing important events from Rome to the Magna Carta. And then below, the next day, previous day, they were doing a sequencing critical events leading up to signing of the Magna Carta. And then um, the week prior, they did this great. Um, strip. So that just shows you, like, in the course of six class days, they're able to publish four or five different times to the web. And I'm thinking about that. If I was doing all of this in a paper-based environment or any on any device other than a Chromebook, it'd take me a whole lot of time to set up the daisy chain of cords because the computers would, after two hours, or seeing the students the flash drives or finding some type of printer. Um, if they were doing it on an iPad, there'd be no way of getting the information out. Um, and it was just so easy because they have their publishing platforms of Twitter or their Tumblrs. They kept their information or what they did via their Twitter accounts. And it's just really cool to see 13-year-olds positive online identity. So back to the presentation. And so, I mean, in summary, like, the, the really easy, intuitive for my students to understand. There's no, I don't have to waste my time explaining to them where the different or the browser button, or to save a flash drive and stuff like that. It's just on, and they've used the internet before, so they understand a Chromebook. Next slide. I need the teacher to maintain. I have one computer running Ubuntu in my classroom, and it spends, I spend every day refreshing or updating the software. I don't know why I have to update it every day, but it tells me I do. But with my Chromebooks, the updating just happens in the background. I have a fancy cart. I just have one um, charge protector with six chargers, so whenever I'm not using it, I plug in six. 
but because the bed is so long, it's not a hassle. And that's the slide. I could get to the increase in instructional time. Like, I didn't know what was possible with Sudo. I was able to put the tools in their hand and the power of the web, and it was a great. So if anybody's ever in the California area, um, area, look me up, and you're welcome to come into the classroom and check it out. So thank you. Thank you so much, James. These are just such fabulous tips, and I love that, that example blog. I'm going to steal that and show that to more people. So thank you, James. I'll go back into the, the main slides that we had in here. I also shared out the, the slides to this, and I added James' link in here if you want to see his slides again as well. I put in um, both the Q&A box and the chat box if you're interested. So do you want me to go ahead and drive your presentation as well? Uh, yes, we'd like you to drive for us. Okay, no problem. Let me just go ahead and start. So Donna, why don't you go ahead and introduce you and your team that are going to be sharing. Great, we're excited to be here. Um, I'm Donna Toiber, and the other team members in Richland District 2 at our district technology uh, integration level are Janine Sears and Marianne Cincinnati, Pam Hanflan. Um, we're just very excited to be working with you. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll talk about awesome teachers. Uh, we went with Google Apps for Education this past summer for our entire district. Uh, we did have some middle school and high school pilots running with Google Apps, so a lot of our teachers were familiar with that. Uh, and now as part of our one-to-one -one initiative, we're putting Chromebooks in many of our classrooms. We just uh, completed one month with these eight fantastic teachers who dug right in. We gave them Chromes for their students, and we, we've been evaluating and observing along the way to, to, to see what's going on in the classrooms. And there's our Day of school, so they weren't all available today to um, to be here because they're busy in their schools wrapping things up. But we're going to share some of the things that they've told us over the last month. Uh, next slide. Uh, many wow moments, and listening to James, I think a lot of them were amazed at how quickly it, the Chromebook starts up, and it just saves some instructional time. But the power of Google Docs has been um, very important for our teachers. They've said, wow, it really is just wonderful for us to be able to integrate that with the Chromebook and the Chrome OS. Uh, they've, they've done lots of things with Google Docs, Google Sites, and the web store apps. Next slide. Uh, student comments you can see here, easier than other computers, more portable, loads faster, you're on the internet, more 21st century. Already on when you open it up. Uh, <coughs> docs are saved automatically. You can talk to your friends while using Google Docs. They love the chat. Work together on projects. Uh, video chat, that's another popular uh, feature. Code app. Uh, we said it helps with her maturity level, so that it helps her to feel like she needs to take care of things, to have the responsibility of the Chromebook. Uh, get to think faster, and it keeps up with my brain. We like that comment. Uh, next slide. Spent uh, a good deal of the last month with these teachers exploring the web store. Some of the things that you've already mentioned are some of their favorites, but enjoyed uh, Mind Mapper, Math Math Crush, Connected Mind, Flocket for presentations, and the Aviary products, uh, Actor Paint, and many of the other Chrome apps that you've mentioned. Next slide. Uh, in our elementary schools, uh, we had fifth grade classes. We've had three different fifth grade classes. And at Forest Lake Elementary, we have students who are reading a blog post about polar bears. They're completing a Google form uh, based on comprehension of the recent updates. And then the teachers get immediate feedback uh, to assess, assess the student knowledge. So she's very, uh, very excited about the Chromebooks, and her kids have gotten into the activities using Google Docs. And Marianne in Cincinnati, she's going to lead you through the next part. Seeing that our kids at Forest Lakes are doing, they're doing some um, underwater world projects. And with that, you know, on the web, they're definitely you know, researching websites. The teacher posts things in Edmodo. It brings their class online. Um, they'll view and create 
presentations um, in Google Presentation, and then they journal what they've learned about. Um, this is a pretty amazing experience for them as we've moved forward with, with our trial period with our, our classroom teachers. Um, next slide. On the Ack Elementary, um, Tim has done a great job with the students. And one of the things that he's really noticed is with the editing process, the collaboration of Google Docs really um, has his students put more into their work. And the students, um, one, one thing that he does with the students is as they're collaborating on their documents, um, they do group chats and they email the transcript of that chat to their teacher. So there's a better understanding of, of what's going on in those chats and their editing process. Slide. Cal Middle, um, Diane Gord is, is she jumped run uh, with the Chromebooks and Google Docs uh, for students. She's started doing e-portfolios with her students' sites. Um, one of the things that she's done um, is a Google Docs project with book review where the students actually created novels and as they worked through the process they used Google Docs um, for their collaboration on their on their um, books. Also used Google Docs for flashcard presentations, to practice for um, quizzes and things like that. Starting a process now, they're writing documentaries and they're using Steelix to create those documentaries or screen uh, and um, documentaries, they're also going to be uh, connecting Google Chat as a way to do some screen captures of videos of the students actually doing an interview. Um, so they're getting pretty creative. Next slide. At Parkway, um, over uh, the Thanksgiving holidays, they began look how to, to, to create a budget. And again, using Google Docs spreadsheet and multi-URL, um, to different grocery stores and they shopped online for what they needed for Thanksgiving and uh, they created a budget and they stayed within the confines of a specific budget. Okay. <laughs> we know um, the kids really love the collaboration in Google Docs um, and the teachers really love the fact that Students can really share their information with them. One of the biggest things that we've learned is to help with the grading process and organizing everything is not only do the students share their documents, but the teachers keep up with their own collections after the children share with them. And <clears throat> a naming convention for the files is very important. Basically, the naming convention um, blocks first name, or excuse me, first name, first initial, aim of the assignment the teacher easy searching for whenever they want to find the assignment in their collections and also when the, the teacher is done getting she places a star next to it to show that it has been graded which is a great way that her and the student know that their their um, assignment has been graded. Next. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the love the way they have multiple opportunities to communicate with one another. Um, video chats, why we've been using it. Uh, I know that one of the schools, I can't remember which one at the moment, is actually beginning to collaborate with another school across the district using Google Chat and chat. So um, just the creation of the Google Apps with the Chromebooks has allowed the ease and mobility and just the excitement to work with other kids. Next slide. At our high school, um, one of our high schools, Blythewood uh, High School, a uh, history teacher has the students creating a daily blog as if they are a historical fiction, uh, figure from the 1850s. And the blogs are based on primary and secondary source readings that they have to do every day. One of the comments that this teacher um, made was leave for a conference for a couple of days. And they decided to go ahead and let the sub continue using the books with the kids, and was amazed that when he came back, work was actually completed. Because you know that sometimes that doesn't necessarily happen when when the main teacher is not in the room. And he just thought that that was great, and he also realized it was amazing how much 
he actually got done in a classroom when he didn't have to print out resources and how much they could actually get to when they could use the Chromebook and integrate it into sites and Blogger and, and Google Docs and so on. It has made his school um, his last time function a lot smoother. And going back to what was even mentioned earlier about integration and and time. <clears throat> the students not all um, content teacher inside and outside of class, uh, mail, and they're using their calendars to, to stay up to date on what they need to get done. Um, the teacher commented that he's had students email him when they're absent for work and just ask him questions in the class to, to clarify what they didn't understand. So it's really begun a great communication tool for uh, our teachers, students. That's the presentation for today. Dana, we just wanted to share some of the highlights of our uh, November uh, Chromebook tryouts. And we're keeping the Chromebooks, of course, and our teachers are very excited about continuing on with their students. So look forward to hearing more about what other schools are doing with their Chromebooks and with Google Apps for Education. Much, Donna. Yeah, this is great. I think my favorite thing was how a teacher stars the assignment in the collection to show that it's graded. That makes so much sense. So, um, and I'll go ahead and pass the the uh, presentation capabilities over to Jason Marty, who is um, from Leiden. And let me make sure he's unmuted. Jason, can you go ahead and speak? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Great. You should have an option now to share something. Did you see that? Yes, I do. All right, go ahead and share your browser or, yep, perfect. We are seeing the now. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here today. Uh, I appreciate hearing from James and, and Donna and her team as well um, and, and stealing a lot of good ideas from them. So hopefully that's what we're able to do. Um, I apologize that none of our teachers were able to make it today because they're actually giving final exams. Uh, but I've been lucky enough to, to talk to all of them as they've been experimenting with Chromebooks and really just, you know, teaching via the Internet, which is something we're really excited about at Leiden. Uh, and I, I did put my, my Twitter profile up there and my email. If anyone wants to contact me, please do so. I'm more than willing to collaborate and share with anybody out there. Um, when we started to kind of go down this path of looking at really moving our classroom to the cloud, one of the things that we thought about was, was what's missing. Um, and certainly access was the, the one key thing that was missing for our students and, and really for our teachers as well. Uh, and this idea that we picked up from, from hearing Jason Glass, the Director of Education in the State of Iowa, speak one time, and he said we want great, great teaching to be systemic, not episodic. And, and I think we can do a lot about that in schools by giving everyone access to the technology they need, and, and everyone meaning students and, and teachers. And we're, we're doing our best to do that. And and I'll talk just a little bit before I get into the specifics about uh, what our teachers are doing as we chose the Chromebook. Uh, based on our experience in one-to-one -one pilot classes, and we, we basically have chose seven different courses, which spreads it out to about 20 teachers in our two high schools, uh, that we've piloted over the last two years as one-to-one -one classrooms. So each classroom has a cart form of netbooks, and we've replaced all of those with the Chromebook because our initial experience is with two classes. Um, and some of them that have already been touched on, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because they've been stressed out by the, uh, the Chrome team, I think. Um, but I think James kind of said the same thing. Really, the technology gets out of the way is one way to put it. And I, I guess what I mean by that is you don't have to be a lab teacher. One of the experiences that we had, and I think James was, again, alluding to some of this with, with some of his devices, is teachers with, with some of the traditional hardware, they felt like they were teaching in a computer lab uh, and not in a classroom where they had to, to really put their hands on the devices to, to kind of troubleshoot things. They had to contact the team frequently. Uh, with the Chromebooks, we not had that issue. Um, we just simply no hardware issues whatsoever with any of our Chromebook experiences. Uh, and the startup time is, is just phenomenal, where there is no loss of instructional time. And, and that's not just the initial startup time at the beginning of the class. I think that's important to realize that, again, the laptop or device shouldn't be open all the time necessarily. You know, good teaching happens both with and without the device, so it's important to be able to go in between those seamlessly, uh, fluidly, and our teachers are able to do that with the Chromebook, whereas before with our uh, more traditional netbooks, if they click lids, and our teachers use that terminology a lot, so they'll just say lids down, we're doing something where we don't need the device right now, 
uh, the network, that might take a few minutes to recover that device from the sleep or the hibernation mode. Uh, with the quick, it's literally back up almost instantaneously once it's been logged in. Um, so, so that's been phenomenal. Battery life, obviously, uh, is a huge advantage for schools. Uh, this idea of nothing but the web, that's an advantage. I think what we've found is that it really opens up our teachers and really, our, more importantly, our students' eyes to all the different possibilities on the Internet as opposed to using more client-based software uh, that we traditionally would have used where they might have been a little bit more, you know, I'm going to do one of these applications because these are the applications offered. Uh, now they, they've really moved on to do a variety of things. The one I'm just to talk about, uh, the Chromebook, for one more second, would be that it really allows students to seamlessly integrate all of the applications available to them. Uh, you know, students are, are very adept now at tabbed browsing, so you'll walk through the classroom and, and many of them have probably eight to ten tabs open at a time, uh, and what you'll see is, is they're going back and forth between all those applications. Where in more of a traditional mindset, you really used to work within one application. And that's kind of gone away because this idea of working on the, on the web has really opened up a lot of doors for them. So I know we might be short on time, and I want to make sure we have questions for the, for the other panelists. But I did want to share some specific examples uh, of some of the ways we've used different applications, both from Google Apps and, and other applications on the, on the web as far as our classrooms moving to the cloud. Uh, one really uh, pretty phenomenal example of using Google Forms uh, that I just saw on a classroom just in the last week and talked to the teacher about was the steps to solving uh, equations. And, and the great things about Forms, and I know both the other presenters talked about this a little bit, is you can get feedback. Uh, both, uh, the Google spreadsheet that it goes into, and also through a script called Flubberoo, which automatically grades the form uh, and can instantaneously email the results to students. What I liked about this particular one, not so much just the questions that were asked, but, but the intent behind the instruction. And, and what this uh, math instructor did was she was able to give this uh, quiz, the step solving an equation, to all of her class, and within a second or two after taking it, had the results. And the nice thing, since she broke up the questions by the steps uh, that were involved in solving for these equations, she was able to then differentiate her instruction for the remaining time in that class period based on those results. So she, if this group of students happened to miss step one, uh, they were grouped together and had some specific targeted uh, sample problems that were used to address that particular issue. And she was able to do that for any students at any particular stage in the equation that they uh, might have kind of misstepped on. So she was able again to give targeted, differentiated instruction, uh, just using a couple of simple tools. That was really a, a, a phenomenal use that, that I thought really a, a positive one. Our Leiden uh, Physics YouTube channel is something pretty neat that a number of our curricular areas are doing, and, and certainly the whole idea of the flipped class uh, is, is out there with Khan Academy and other things. And our teachers really have, have kind of taken a personal approach to this. Instead of sending our students off to, to see someone else's explanation, they put a number of their own explanations, and really almost on a daily basis, some of our teachers uh, will load, and a lot of this is directly from their smart board. So they do smart board demonstration, they simply record it with the audio of them explaining it, and then they can post it that night. Sometimes it's a preview of, of a coming uh, content that they're going to work with the next day, and sometimes it's used for students to review. And these are actually all public, uh, so they have thousands and thousands of hits from, from students all over the country that are using our, our teachers' physics classes as, a, as review material which is exciting. A uh, class that, that has their own YouTube channel is actually our culinary arts class. And they've moved all 62 of their cooking demonstrations in their various culinary classes to a YouTube channel. So instead of taking you know, five or 10 minutes uh, in a class period to demonstrate uh, a cooking uh, technique or a specific recipe, their students watch it the previous night, and then they walk in the door having already seen the demonstration and can actually use all of the class time uh, preparing that uh, recipe. So again, that's something that opens up instructional time because of this access to technology. Um, just, just one or two I wanted to show you real quick. Storify is a really exciting application uh, that we've, we've used quite a bit in our uh, English and our, our social studies classrooms especially. And what Storify basically is, is it's, it's a product or an application that curates from all over the web. So this particular assignment, um, one of English teachers assigned uh, their students just a topic of their choice based on the theme from a book that they had read in class, which is actually about the Vietnam War, uh, but they were able to kind of take that idea of protest uh, and, and apply it to any topic they wanted. So this particular student kind of used the Occupy Wall Street movement and was able to, to, to pull YouTube videos and then write a reflection, ask a question, and then with each question 
and they ask, they have to do an additional piece of research that would lead them to another YouTube clip or perhaps a Twitter feed, as you see here. Uh, and then it, it kind of created this cycle of learning. And, and kind of the neat thing about this project is that uh, the teacher didn't give necessarily a due date to the end of this project. So it's become perpetual learning, and the kids have actually come back to this time and time again because the assignment is at the end of each analysis of each particular document, they have to ask another question, which leads them to another piece of research. So it really does breed a, a culture of learning that uh, we're really excited about. Um, maybe just one more quick example. I, I, the whole idea behind this moving to the cloud, we want people to be able to Google our students. So one that we're specifically excited about um, is a student that was highlighted by a brand new application called Schemify. Uh, and they just happened to pick up uh, on our students' project because uh, one of our teachers post has uh, his class post their Web 2.0 project to Twitter and create a hashtag with his class name. Uh, and so they post their project there, and this particular application saw that they were using their application and it chose to highlight it in their first blog post about this brand new application that's out. And the application is it's kind of a curation tool similar to Storify, but it puts in more of an ebook format. And this particular one, I'm sorry, I'm going to someone else's now because they probably moved our students down a little bit. Here it is. Uh, their, their goal or their, their uh, project was to create a diary of a Vietnam soldier. Um, so this particular student used that opportunity to kind of create dialogue back and forth through letters um, between her father and her writing back and forth while he was uh, away at war. And so she was able to include photographs, of the internet and create this uh, diary online. And something like this certainly could have been created without the internet, but they were able to pull all the information together and present it in a format and then shout is something really excited about. We're really uh, excited that our students are publishing instead of handing in assignments now, uh, and that they're not just going to do a teacher, but they're really going to the world, a lot of our students' assignments. And, and that's something we're, we're uh, again, really excited about. A couple of additional apps, extensions, and sites I just really wanted to mention. Uh, and it'll probably have time to go into them. So again, I want to save some time for questions for, for everyone else. Uh, Blogger is something we, our teachers have used extensively. Well, they'll create a blog and have students comment on it, and certainly student-created blogs. Prezi is another uh, Web 2.0 collaborative uh, presentation application. It's, it's a little more dynamic than maybe some of the more standard presentation tools. Ego is social bookmarking, and that's an extension that's a really powerful extension um, in Chrome and in Chrome OS, and Dorify, Themify, and Twitter, which I mentioned before. And uh, so to kind of end on this note from George Kuros, who's a principal uh, in Canada, actually, uh, that uh, I communicate a lot with on Twitter, and he, he has this kind of way of summing things up about moving to the cloud, and I think just this idea of accessing technology. It's the whole idea of we shouldn't, uh, should not do things differently, we should do different things. I think that's what I think you saw from, from all the, the presentations from the learning that's going on today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And again, these are all just really, great. and it's a, it's great to see um, it's to see all of these examples that we can share with everybody else. So there are a few um, questions that have come up that I'd like to pose to uh, everybody who is. is I, I think Donna, Donna might have need to go early, and I know we're running a bit over, but. Um, James and Jason, there's uh, somebody who is asking, can teachers realistically teach from a Chromebook? And love to manage all their devices, both student and teacher, from one place. So you've been using it for a few months now, and I think that the answer that, to that would be yes. But I don't know if you would like to elaborate at all. Um, one thing, one thing I found is if I do it from from the same. If I can do it from the, the Chrome browser, I can do it from a Chromebook. So I have a really nice fancy uh, iMac at home. Now, I was really excited about it, but then I find myself in my creative presentation. I created it in Google Presentation. At the time I'm creating a graphic organizer for my students, I'm creating it in Google Drive and adding, giving them a copy of it. And once you've gone to the web and realized how robust and how many tools are there, um, you're probably never going to look back. Um, so um, I do all of my lesson planning from my iMac at home. Everything is done in the Chrome browser. And because of that, um, it would work fine on a Chromebook, and everything runs on Chrome. I just um, happen to have a, a pretty a pretty device for running a web browser at home. <laughs> and another question for you on: Do your students use Gmail through your apps account? If so, how is that used or monitored? 
Uh, yeah, I have you know a private Google Apps for EDU account, and everything is is done through that. Um, we don't use email too often, um, so we basically use it to get at our Google Docs and stuff like that. So whenever I want to see something, they share with me. Uh, I know in email, I have the option of turning off and turning on who can email them, um, but I just have it open. I just found that we just don't have a need for email because the last thing I want is um, 83 documents or email sitting in my inbox, so I just have them publish it to their portfolio or share a doc with me, and then it's automatically in a nice, easy folder where, and I love the idea of they came with star in the assignments when it, when they grade. I'm gonna you know pick up, um, but I don't. We don't really use email. It's just a nice thing to have when we're just signing up for some new web tool. So um, Jason, James, and Donna, if you guys are still on, do you guys whitelist um, apps and extensions, and or do you leave it open? Do you whitelist the ones that you guys were making specifically, or? Uh, Jason, so far Lydon, we've taken an open stance to this, uh, and we have an open uh, Chrome Web Store right now, and we're piloting that as we're looking forward to hopefully moving to a one-to-one -one environment. We're going to have to make a decision on that. Uh, but, but right now we've been open, and then just ask the teachers if, if there are any issues with specific apps that are maybe distracting. We can certainly blacklist those, but we have got to have a pretty open policy because we find our students or some of the uh, people find most of the exciting applications out there for them to use. Um, Richland, too, this is Mary Ann. Um, we basically have an open app store, but our filtering system we're finding has blocked a lot of the app access. So as teachers want to use them, they're just requesting for those apps to be unblocked, and, and we're, we're opening them up. So we pretty much have an open store now. And this is for all of you, and I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, is it does come up fairly frequently, given, given where we're at in technology and, and education, is if you, as a teacher, were simply given the choice of iPad or Chromebook, which would you choose? Uh, I, we had a great, great discussion. Do a, do a podcast with some other educators around the country, and we had a great discussion on um, Chromebooks as iPads. And I think the biggest argument for Chromebooks over iPads is the ability to, to create and input. iPads are great for consumed content. Um, and if I was doing a lot, lot of e-books and stuff, and I just wanted them to read it and maybe write in a journal, um, I think that might be the best solution. Uh, if I want my students to be writing or creating or publishing or collaborating, um, it's definitely not, not a cool choice. And I know there's a lot of teachers that have had experiences with just the uh, setup time imaging iPads. Like, I wish I had time to do my really as a teacher. Well, we just don't have much time to devote to device management. So if the school has the resources of adding another employee to manage devices um, and they are just consuming content, then maybe the iPad is the best choice. Um, but if you don't and you want your students to be creating, um, I would definitely recommend the Chromebook. I mean, I echo James' thoughts both on the being a creative device uh, as well as the management. I think you know if it, if it was the best choice at Leiden, we would choose the iPad because we would do what we would have to do to to manage it, which would be much more difficult. Um, how, however, I just I just don't think it's it's the most dynamic and the most open choice. And we really wanted to, to choose something that was open, not box our teachers into having to use specific things or being limited by whether it's the absence of a keyboard or you know a limited browser and, and those types of things. And we really believe Home OS and the Chromebook gives us the most open choice for our teachers and our students. And we, we, they've pretty much covered all of the answers there. Great. And um, let's see, it, uh, this is kind of an interesting one on the web has a lot of distractions since it is nothing but the web. How do you manage the distractions? So it's more like classroom management and training for the teachers once students have this kind of device in front of them. Um, for me, uh, the role of a 21st century educator is one who curates and adds value that may be curating your own presentation to your students or your own resources for your students, but it may be pulling in from others to Attraction. I, I curate um, their experiences for them. Every link I want them to be using um, is either embedded in the blog or added to the website. Um, and so there's very few times where I'll just send them out to the web and, and do their own discovery. So there's you know very clear um, expectations in a classroom culture around respecting devices. I like to keep everything as open as possible. Um, and so I know that there would be ways for me to go into the, the filters and, and and add restrictions on whatever or close down different tools and stuff. But for me, it's just more of a culture building piece for the students because you know what they're doing in class 
So, you know, obviously they can go home and I want them to see it as a tool rather than a toy. And I would maybe just add to that. Um, I mean, I think all the, the the ideas and the activities and, and the learning that was demonstrated today by all by all three schools. I think in those classrooms, you're you're not going to have distracted students because I mean, these are some of the most engaging activities that I think any of us have probably ever seen. Um, and as we move to more and more engaging activities, engaging students and learning, uh, that's as any teacher will say, the best classroom management is a good lesson plan. Uh, and good lesson plans are becoming much more dynamic than ever with the access to this type of technology. There are a few more questions on here, but I, I realize that we've run out of time. But this is a fabulous info. So thank you, Donna, Marianne, Jason, and James for sharing all this great information. And again, this uh, webinar has been recorded, so I will be posting a link to the YouTube um, video of this as well as the slides that everybody shared. Um, you can also access these publicly. I shared them before. So thank you again for joining, and I will follow up if there are some questions in here that didn't get addressed. I will um, our panelists here to, to take a look and, and answer them in, in writing, and we'll share that Q&A transcript as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and uh, we hope that you were able to learn some new strategies of how you can move your classroom to the web.